And what I learned by studying this passage is something that I trust will be of a special blessing to each of you. 1 Kings chapter 19, let's read verses 5, 6, and 7. The Bible says in verse 5, And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked or baconed uh, 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 on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid down again. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Now, one of the things that you learn as you study the Bible is when you read in the Scriptures when it says the angel of the Lord, that's different than an angel or a angel of the Lord. The angel is always a Christophany, an appearance of Christ. So you notice here in verse number 7 that the angel of the Lord, uh, it says, came again the second time. So we see a very important passage of Scripture and one that ought to catch our attention as we look at these verses right on through verse number 9 by the time we finish up. You know, we learn from the New Testament something that I have held on to uh, all of my life through rough times. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation, no test, taken you, but such is common to man. But God will with that test. He says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer, will not permit you to be tempted or tested above that you're able. You've often heard, I'm sure, the phrase, God won't put anything more on you than what you're able to, to handle. Well, that, the idea of that comes from this verse. He says, God will not permit you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the test, the temptation, also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Now, perhaps uh, we think that our testings are different than anybody else has ever experienced. Uh, nobody's ever done what we've done or had to go through what we have got to go through, but that's just not the case. They are common to man. Isn't that what Paul said? You'll never go through anything but such as common to other people. Now, circumstances may differ. The circumstances that you're going through may be different from what I go through. The, but the test is still the same. Not all of us can run from somebody like Jezebel. But we're all subject to fear. We're all subject to discouragement. So our, the circumstances may be different, but the problems are all the same. I think it's very comforting to realize that God knows us intimately. Amen? Amen. He knows us inside and out. I love Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14, the psalmist said, Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. So the Lord is either going to lighten your burden, or he's going to increase your strength. He knows what you're made out of. He knows what you can handle. So the Bible promises that God is either going to Light the burden, or he's going to give you the strength as you go through it. Another verse that I really like, and I hold on to it many, many times, is something Paul wrote to young Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So Elijah failed, but it was just a temporary failure. He temporarily dropped his experience of faith, but God didn't abandon him. Did you notice that? Even though he was discouraged and was not living by faith under the juniper tree, God still didn't abandon his servant. God is faithful to his own. I don't care whether you're male, female, tall, short, green, purple. It doesn't matter God is faithful to his own people. <clears throat> he didn't remove the wicked queen Jezebel. God didn't just snap his fingers and Jezebel disappear. Uh, he didn't do it then. He doesn't do it now. 
he uh, he didn't do some great mighty work <clears throat> in Israel. He did, however, make a way of escape for his dejected servant, and he gave him strength. <coughs> he gave him the strength that he needed. So God's eye, <coughs> excuse me, God's eye had followed every step that Elijah had taken. There wasn't a time that God wasn't with Elijah. He didn't. He didn't love the prophet less because the prophet didn't stand in victory. He didn't love him less under the juniper tree than he loved him up on Mount Carmel. He loved him the same. God's love isn't based on your ability or my ability. Aren't you glad? His love is not based on what you do and what you don't do. He loves us. Matter of fact, you remember what the writer to the Hebrews said? God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you might be boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And so the important thing is to realize that no matter what you're going through, God said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So God doesn't condone or encourage wrong behavior in believers. He's not saying, y'all just do what you want to do. And don't worry about it, I'm going to love you anyway. That's not what he's talking about. He didn't approve of Elijah's wish for death. Remember, Elijah said, Lord, why don't you just take my life? He didn't approve of that wish, uh, but he gave him rest, which is what he really needed. God felt for his child, and he gave him the bodily help that he really needed. God gave his beloved sleep, sleep, as the psalmist said. Uh, Elijah uh, found that though the weeping may endure for the night, joy cometh in the morning. That's also found in the Word of God. So, good, wholesome, restful sleep is a blessing from God. Whenever we can rest, when we've had discouragement or dismay, many times we get up with a whole different perspective. What healing and strength lie in becoming unconscious just for a short time. God set a divine watch while Elijah slept. God set a divine watch over his servant and the mind so recently agitated and the heart that was so recently filled with fear was quieted and was given peace. God gave him what he needed. He gave him rest. Now, in reading this passage, there were two things that I wanted to point out to you. The first is the ministry of angels. Angelology is what it's called in theological terms. And so we find in this passage something very important to you and to me. And that is the ministry that these angels have. There was still a great distance that Elijah had to go, but God watched over Elijah as he slept, he gave him sleep. Even though he went to, to sleep that night discouraged, God gave him rest. He wasn't forsaken, but uh, was provided for with rest and with food for a journey that still had many, many miles to cover. So here we have a demonstration of the ministry of angels for those who are the children of the Lord. So we have to remember that there's a difference between those who don't fear the Lord and are presumptuous, and, and people like Elijah who ran for his life, but he never turned his back on God. Every one of us are going to go through difficult times, but it doesn't mean that you have to turn your back on God. God's tender care of such uh, is expressed through the ministry of angels as we read through the scriptures. The same angel who delighted to witness God's majesty and greatness before the throne are the same angels that ministered to God's saint here on this earth. The same angel who has seen Christ in heaven, the glory of God, have been given the job to minister to God's children. So this action on the part of God is typical to his nature and the nature of God's grace. He takes no account of our worthiness or our unworthiness his grace is free. His grace is sovereign. Whether you're worthy or unworthy, grace is not based on your merit. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's what you get that you don't deserve. That's what 
grace is all about. Can you imagine, just for a minute, and I sat and I thought about it this uh, today, can you imagine an angel doing such lowly task as cooking a meal for some discouraged, disgruntled saint of God? And yet that's what we read about here. When the angel's regular assignment was to stand before Almighty God and, and say, as in Isaiah chapter 6, Holy, holy, holy. That was their job. That was their privilege. And yet here, this angel, uh, the angel of the Lord, or any angel that's been given the opportunity to minister to God's people, many times are given a thankless and dirty job. So there's no grumbling on the part of this messenger. And he loved to do what he did. You know, I thought about this throughout the scripture. You'll remember that when Lot was in Sodom, that it was an angel that came to warn him to get out of the wicked city because God was going to destroy it with fire. An angel was given that task. Remember Daniel? Daniel was cast in the lion's den, but an angel was with him, sent from God, and that angel shut the mouth of the lions in the... In the and by the way, sometimes we see that picture, one or two lions. The lion's den was filled with many lions. And yet every one of them sitting down with their mouth shut because an angel made it so. When Lazarus, you remember the beggar? When Lazarus died, the Bible says, angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. I believe that Luke also teaches us that when God's people die, God sends angels to escort us to the very presence of the Lord. And so we find <clears throat> that that here, Lazarus, when he died, an angel carried him into Abraham's bosom. When Peter was cast into prison, you'll remember, and the authorities planned to put him to death. It was an angel that came by night, woke him up, cast off his chains, and opened up the gates to the prison and let him out. It was an angel. It was also an angel that stood by Paul when the ship was was uh, on about its last leg, about ready to break into pieces and fall asunder. The, uh, and Paul was, was afraid for his own life. It was an angel sent from God who told him that nobody on board that ship was going to perish and that they were going to make the land. So this truth that I'm pointing out right here is the ministry of angels. And I think it's a wonderful truth to consider. Because it's not just happen, it doesn't just happen to people in the Bible. This is the ministry of God's created beings, uh, the angels. God has assigned an angel to every one of his own. You've heard about guardian angels. God has assigned an angel to every one of his own. Uh, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. And evil forces from the heavenlies are coming up against us. And we're adequately provided for whatever we need to be sufficient to have victory. Let me share something with you found in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 10. Angels play a very important role in regard to the children of God. And this is something we need to always keep in mind. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So God has assigned a special angel to every child. These children have their angel before the face of God. And this is a remarkable statement, but it's true. Why? Because God said it. God can't lie. Let me show you another verse. Psalm 91, verse 11. In Psalm 91, verse 11, the Bible says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, this was written concerning the man who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, the man who fears and reverences God. The Bible says he, God, is, God gives his angels charge over that kind of person. Psalm 34, verse 7, the Bible says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about uh, them that fear him and deliver them. So this is provision which God makes. Angels are sent to minister to uh, God's purpose uh, with God's purpose in view. Whatever God's purpose is in your life, 
God uses his angels to minister in your life. It's no wonder then, I think, that God sent another angel to minister to his servant Elijah. He sent him to prepare him for a long journey that he was about to take. So Elijah had set uh, his heart on uh, set his heart on going to Mount Horeb. We're going to talk about Mount Horeb next week. Remember where what Mount Horeb was? That's where Moses heard from God. And Elijah had his heart set on going to Mount Horeb, and that's the same mountain where Moses and God met. Perhaps Elijah thought that Moses had an experience when he presented himself to the children of Israel. Remember, his face was in a glow after he came out of the presence of God. And Elijah said, I'm so discouraged, I just want to talk to God face to face. And he was going to head where he knew Moses had met with the Lord. There are times, I think, folks, when each of us feel that if we just had a different environment, if we just had a different house, if we just had a different uh, job, if we just had a different church, if we just had a different environment, it would make everything so much easier. Every preacher says, if I just had another church, you know what I found after 50 years of doing this? There are people just like every one of you in every church I've been in, so there's no need in my trying to run from you. <laughs> right? They don't look like you, but they act like you. And I've been the same preacher in every church that I've been in. Maybe that's the problem. But here we find that we'll see, in Elijah's case, what a change in environment did for him. Though he couldn't have, uh, though he could have uh, had the same experience with God, even if he had stayed in Israel, he, he was determined that he was going to run until he got to Mount Horeb. So Elijah needed spiritual refreshing. He needed revival. He needed to go aside from the duties of being God's prophet and spend a little time with the Lord. So our Savior did this quite often. Many times, you know, the Bible teaches that Jesus went off into the mountains to pray. God allowed His servant to, to take this long, hard journey across the desert. And in grace, He provided for him and He accompanied him. So whether or not Elijah was in the direct will of God by being under the juniper tree, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But the thing that I want to point out is that even under the juniper tree, Elijah is still seeking to put God first. He wants to talk to God. Even though he may be out of God's will, he's seeking God's face. So the Lord didn't forsake him. And God won't forsake us either. Amen? Amen. Let me show you verse number 8 in our text. Verse number 8, we read this. In verse 8 it says, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength that the meat uh, forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So again, Elijah experienced the supernatural strength that the Lord provided. You remember, he took off after Mount Carmel and outran a chariot all the way to Jezreel, 18 miles away. We see him go uh, at this particular point. He's already traveled a 100 miles just to get to where he's at at the juniper tree. And now he's got 200 more miles to go just to get to Mount Horeb. And the Bible teaches us here that he did so on the meal that God provided for him under the juniper tree. He had enough strength to last him for 40 days and 40 nights while he finished that journey out. That reminds me of the children of Israel as they were in the wilderness. The Bible says that as they walked through the wilderness for 40 days, for 40 years, as they walked through the wilderness, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. I looked for places to shop when my kids grew up, my, my children, and it started out with feet like this and ended up with feet like that. And I couldn't keep up with the shoes and the clothes. You know how it is. But here we find that even the children of Israel, remember when the crowd of over 5,000 men plus women and children met around, uh, the Lord was teaching them. The disciples said, how are we going to feed this bunch? Jesus said, what do we have? Well, you got five loaves and two fish. What is that among so many? And he says, y'all just sit down, get a basket, and put it here. And it says they filled up 12 baskets and there was enough left over for seconds the next day. Isn't that great? God, Jesus took care of all that. When I used to teach children, I love teaching children about Bible stories. 
And I always ask him, I said, what is your favorite Bible story? And one little fellow stood up and he said, I like the story where they loafed and fished. And I've always remembered what that little fellow said. Loafed and fished. So the Lord fed uh, thousands of people on five loaves and two fish. And while in the desert, the Israelites uh, didn't have lack for, for clothing, and God provided them water and manna from heaven. There's a song that I learned years ago. You may know it, you may not know it. But I wanted you to look at the words of this particular song. You may remember it. If you do, sing it with me. The writer said, He giveth more grace when the burdens are greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. Then the chorus, his love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again. The second verse is very important. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when we when we exhausted it, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. Amen? I love that. And then His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. So like Elijah, we all come to times of discouragement. Every one of us. But none of us are immune. And regardless of the cause of your discouragement or my discouragement, we need to learn from the experience of Elijah that God is never discouraged and God never gives up. Remember that lesson. When God had laid the responsibility for some work or some obligation on you or on me, we need to learn not to give up. When God places that on you, don't give up. Sometimes God's plans don't coincide with the way we think things should go. The way we think things should be. It doesn't enter in on our way of thinking, whether it's with our family or our spouse. Not all of our plans are short range. Many of them are long range. And though at this particular time in Elijah's life, his plans were not short range, they were long range. Now, not only do we see the ministry of angels in Elijah's life, but we see the fact that God loved Elijah. Remember, he's a backslidden prophet right now. But God's love for Elijah never waned. Uh, he's discouraged, uh, and yet he's still the recipient of God's love in a very special way. He didn't re God didn't rebuke this tired, depressed servant. Did you notice that? God didn't rebuke him. What did God do? He gave him food. He gave him rest. He gave him protection. He gave him comfort. He gave him strength through the ministry of the angels. Now, there's three things that I want you to jot down that we learn from this passage about the love of God. First of all, we learn that God's love is constant. It's constant. Perhaps he may have feared that because he had run from Jezebel that God wouldn't love him anymore. I run into people like that all the time because they've fallen away from God or because they fell into sin. Oh, God won't love me anymore. But may I say to you, if you read this story, even though he was on a juniper tree, even though he was discouraged, even though he had left the work behind, God still loved him. Still loved him. God still loves you and he loves me. The love of God never changes. Though our awareness of God's love changes, God's love never changes. Just like the sun may go behind the clouds, but the sun is still shining. Amen. Though uh, at nighttime it disappears to the other side of the earth, but it's still shining. And sometimes we can't see the love of God, 
but it still shines as bright as it did before. The circumstances of your life and my life may surround us like a cloud, but and that mantle of night may seem to be crowded in, but God's love never changes. It's still with you, and it's still with me. So Elijah also learned that God's love is still being manifested in very special ways during the time that he sat under the juniper tree. There's no mention, by the way, there's no mention of an angel when Elijah was carried to the brook Cherith. Read it again. No angel mentioned when he was taken to the brook Cherith. There was no angel mentioned concerning his stay with the widow at Zarephath. No angel mentioned. Something was needed more than ever before at this particular point. He needed something that only God could send by, by this messenger. In Elijah's case, in order to assure this prophet that he was still loved, and to bring him to the place of repentance and usefulness, God sent an angel to help him. So we can see this in Peter's experience. You remember Peter denied the Lord three times. Three times. And then if you read in Mark chapter 16, you find that, that when the angel met with the women who had gone to the tomb, it says they said, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth which was crucified, he is risen, he's not here, behold the place where they laid him. Now look, but go your way and tell his disciples and Peter, and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. So the fact that Peter was especially mentioned in Mark chapter 16 is a message of God's love for Peter. So we find out, first of all, God's love is constant. But the second thing we notice from this story is God's love is a giving type of love. It's called agape love, a giving kind of love. Our affection and consideration for people may be shaken by circumstances. Somebody might hurt your feelings and your love for them may be shaken. But may I say to you, God's love is just the opposite. God continues to give His love regardless of what we do. It is a giving kind of love. It was while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. That's what the Bible says. The Lord went out uh, after the wandering sheep and carried Him back home, left the 99 and went after the one. When the prodigal son returned back home, it was the, for the prodigal that the father killed the fatted calf and had a party for this son that was lost, was found. He was blind and now see, he was dead and now he's alive. So God, who gave his only begotten son, uh, will allow nothing to separate him from the love of God. Now there's a translation that I like to use. It's the Williams translation. It's an old translation of the scriptures. But in the Williams translation, I love Romans chapter 8. Chapter 6 of Romans, he talks about, uh, about sin. Then chapter 7, he says, how shall I be delivered from this body of death? But in chapter 8 of Romans, he talks about the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And in the Williams translation, beginning in verse 31, we read what, what Paul wrote. He says, what are we then to say to the facts like these? If God is for us, who can be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him graciously give us everything else? Who can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who declared them in, in right standing. Who can condemn them? Christ Jesus who died, or rather, who was raised from the dead, is now at God's right hand and is actually pleading for us. Who can separate us from Christ's love? Can suffering or misfortune or persecution or hunger or destitution or danger or the sword? As the scripture says, for your sake, you are being put uh, to death the live long day. We are 
treated like sheep to being taken to the slaughter. And yet in all these things, we keep on gloriously conquering through Him who loved us. For I have full assurance that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor the present, nor the future, nor evil forces above or beneath, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God as shown in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? You ought to read it in your Bible. You ought to memorize that passage. Romans chapter 11, another wonderful chapter that tells us the same thing. In chapter 11, beginning to verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. The third thing I want you to notice about God's love that we see from this passage is that God's love endures. Using an angel as his messenger, God, first of all, provided Elijah with food. That's what he needed. He'd been traveling for a long time out in the desert. And as he slept for a while, the angel awakened him and had him rise up and eat, and get ready for the long trip. There's no let up with God's love. It suffered long. It was kind. It endured all things. And God's love would never fail. After he had rested and was refreshed, Elijah was ready for the next phase in the ministry of what God gave him to do. You know, this is spoken of all through the Scriptures. One passage that I came across earlier this week is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes in chapter 40, verse 28 through 31, and he says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator, the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There's no searching of His understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that, that have no might. He increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, Elijah rose up. And he went in the strength provided by the angels, the rest and the food for 40 days and 40 nights. Look at verse number 9. In verse 9, he came hither unto the cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? So this was the question that God raised to Elijah it's sort of like in Jonah chapter, uh, chapter 3, it says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah again. Here the word of the Lord comes. God is finally speaking to Elijah in a cave. And he says to him very simply, What are you doing here? What are you doing here? He had already traveled 100 miles to get to the juniper tree. He had 200 miles to go to get to Mount Horeb. Folks, perhaps Elijah felt that in, in this place, he'd be able to speak to God like Moses did. But Elijah wasn't in the will of God when he fled from Jezebel. But it looks as though the Lord directed his steps and was directing him to Horeb. Because when he got to the cave, God spoke again. Elijah was back in communication with, with the Lord. Folks, listen. God is sovereign in His grace. And He didn't forsake His servant. In his hour of need, God was still there. Amen. Amen? Next week, we're going to find out what happens when Elijah gets to the place where Moses had met with God. I've been to Mount Horeb, by the way. It's an interesting place. Climbed up on camelback. I'll never do that again. <laughs> that camel had bones I don't want to feel anymore. But the fact of the matter is, it's a wonderful place to realize that this is where Moses 
spoke with God. Let's see what happens when Elijah gets there next week. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to study Your Word, learn about Your love, how You love us, even when we're so unlovely, when we run from You, when we are anything but spiritual. Father, I pray that You'll help us to walk with the knowledge that there is no test, no temptation that will come to us, but such as common to man. But God will, with the test, make a way of escape. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.